lift your hands toward you heaven. Are my God. And talk to the Lord from the depths of your heart. Give him praise. Give him glory. Give him worship. Honor his name. For the privilege of knowing him. For the privilege of fellowship. Just go ahead and thank the Lord. Thank you precious father. For your loving kindness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercies. We love you. We thank you for all you've done. We thank you for all you are doing. We thank you for all you were yet to. It's not by power. It's not by might. But it's by your spirit. Lord we honor you. We magnify your name. Take all the praise. Take all the glory. In Jesus precious name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Wow. It's always a privilege to come together to fellowship in God's presence. The Bible said, Behold how beautiful and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in harmony. He said, It's like the dew upon the mountains of Hermon. He said, Dear the Lord commands his blessings. There are many principles that make for blessings in the kingdom, but just in case you don't know how to tap into them, there is an insurance policy that the Lord has made available to us. And he said, where we gather together in harmony, he said, dear, the Lord commands his blessings. And so when you come into a corporate fellowship like this, sometimes you make contact with graces, not just the grace of the person ministering from the altar, but the person you are sitting next to. He may carry so much favor, he may carry so much anointing, and just by fellowshipping with you, you come under his radar. And you leave that meeting and things just happen around your life. You can't trace it, but good things just begin to happen. That's why the place of fellowship is a wealthy place. It's a place to find yourself. It's a place to make efforts to come to. Sometimes you may not even be picked out and prophesied to. I remember there was a time in my life, I wondered why no prophet would give me a word of knowledge. I was so troubled. So when prophets come for meetings, I will try by all means for them to see me. Sometimes when they are ministering, I will stand up and lift my hand. I assume, okay, maybe it's because they are looking for those who are in a spiritual position. So I will close my eyes and lift my hands. For where? They will bypass me. They will never give me words. And God began to help me. And I started making friends with prophets. And these prophets will go out, they will prophesy to everybody. And they will never give me a word. I said, what is the meaning of this? <laughs> And so there are people like that that don't receive words of knowledge. You come for a meeting, you are wondering, why didn't they touch me? Why didn't they lay hands on me? The Bible said, dear, the Lord commands his blessings. If you come under that atmosphere, you already become a candidate of blessings. As far as your faith is released, you can receive anything. He said, it's like the oil flowing from the head of Aaron. Down to his skirt. He said, dear, the Lord commands his blessings. That's why we gather together like this. It's not for the formality of it, but because there is a spiritual operation that begins to take place every time we are gathered together. And so when you make the effort to come, be connected, be focused, because there is something the Lord will make available to you. Praise the name of the Lord. And so if any, is anybody in the house tonight that is assured that there is a blessing allocated for him or her in this service? Come on, give the Lord a shout! Hallelujah. Tonight is a special night. I want to start a new series. Usually what I, have, I try to do is to run two parallel series because of the urgency and because of the, the ground we have to cover. We just have to run two series every time we gather or every week the Lord allows us the opportunity to share. And so in the middle of the week, we began a series on spiritual foundations. And we are trying to examine precepts upon precepts, line upon line, what it takes to grow from a baby Christian 
to a mature believer. And so we are looking at the doctrine of salvation. That's what we are currently working on. And so for the Sunday service, we want to start another series today on kingdom dominion. <laughs> you cannot but dominate your world. You cannot. There is no spirituality that exonerates dominion. Whichever sphere you find yourself, if you are spiritual, one of the signs that you are spiritual is that you begin to dominate that realm. You begin to dominate that sphere. And this is why it's important for us to understand the laws and the principles that make for dominion. The reason is because the realm is governed by laws and principles. The realms don't just exist haphazardly. The realms don't just exist randomly. Everything happening is governed by deliberate and definite laws. And so one of the ways to walk in dominion is to understand how the laws work and align yourself with these laws. Laws are not meant as a disadvantage. They are actually the forces that keep creation in its balance. And so every time a man wants to truly make progress, he must understand principles and laws, align himself with these principles and these laws, and he will discover that success in life, victory in life, dominion in life will become natural to him. There is no favoritism with God. The people making impact are not making impact because God is specially, you know, predisposed towards them. God loves everyone equally and every resource for greatness and for victory in life is equally available to every man. When you see a man making impact, it's because he has a definite understanding of spiritual laws and principles and he has given himself to those laws and is applying those laws correctly. And so when a believer wants to make progress in life, one of the things he must do is to ensure that he understands the laws that govern the realm. As he begins to apply these laws, things will begin to work for him so much that it will look as though God is specially predisposed to blessing him. But that's not the situation. Every one of us is destined for greatness. Every one of us is destined for blessings. And every one of us is destined for dominion. Praise the name of the Lord. Are we together? And so because tonight is an introductory service to this series, I will take my time to explain the foundational principles and the foundational laws that makes for dominion. In the, subsequ in the, the subsequent services, we will take time to deal with them one at a time. Praise the name of the Lord. Ah, that sound you are playing. Is that Hallelujah. 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 Can the choir help us for one minute? Ha. That sound touched my spirit. Hallelujah. 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 
of the Lord. You know, next weekend is first, is first weekend, right? Next Sunday is first Sunday of the month. So next Sunday will be a miracle service. <laughs> yes. So what we'll do is um, every first Sunday of the month, we'll have miracle service. So that we'll start the service with a buffet, a spiritual buffet. Praise the Lord. Every first Sunday of the month, miracle service. We'll do that. So next Sunday will be a miracle service. Bring the sick. God will touch them. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So dominion is simply the capacity to enforce the will. The will of God in a context. Dominion is simply the capacity, the authority to enforce or to bring the will of God into a context until the will of God becomes the prevailing dominion over a definite context. Praise the name of the Lord. It's the ability to enforce the will of God in a context so that God holds sway and prevailing dominion. One of the reasons we were created is actually for that purpose. God has an agenda in his heart that he wants superimposed over our sphere of existence. And so, handed to everyone that is given the privilege of existence is a chance to enforce the will of God in a context. Now, many times, because people don't understand the place of dominion in their existence, they begin to pursue, wow, God bless you. It's good to have you. My brother, Apostle Adewale, God bless you. All the way from the city of Ibadan. Thank you for coming. So good to have you. Salute every minister who is here by extension. Thank you for coming. God bless you richly. Celebrate you. Glory to God. So please, tonight you will write. Because eventually as I begin to go high on this subject, we will enter some mystical dimensions. You know, I was in Kenya and I started teaching them about sonship. And I told them when you become a son, there are two corridors you are permitted to walk in. The first corridor you are permitted to walk in is the corridor of priesthood. And the second corridor you are permitted to walk in is the corridor of kingship. And I was teaching them what it takes to be a son. And I told them, according to scriptures, there are four biblical provisions that make for a son in the realm of God. And I said, the first thing that makes you a son in the realm of God is the ability to behold the image of God. That's the only time you are changed from glory to glory. I said the second thing that makes you a son is your ability to submit to the government and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. They that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I said the third thing that makes you a son is your ability to stay under the chastening of the Lord. Because if you are not a bastard and you are a son, then you will be chastened of the Lord. And finally, I told them what makes you a son in this kingdom are the responsibilities you can take, the responsibilities you can bear. Children consume, sons serve. And so as I began talking to them, it looked basic until we entered priesthood. And I started teaching them the dynamics of priesthood. And I told them, prayer is not just to speak in tongues for five hours. I told them, prayer is a transport medium in the spirit. And when you start praying in the spirit, what happens is that you remove the influence of time from your existence. So what you do is that you bridge the immortal realm with the mortal realm. You breathe the eternal realm with the natural realm. And when you are able to do that, you will discover that men don't die. So you will notice that Elijah is still here, but he's in a different dimension. And the point will come when you pray, Elijah can come into your atmosphere. Now, when Elijah comes into your atmosphere, the laws that Elijah obey is different from the laws you obey. You, you are in the dispensation of grace. Elijah was not in the dispensation of grace. So if an intercessor, if you insult an intercessor, he may forgive you, but you may die. Because Elijah is now part of his army. 
And if you insult him, you are insulting his entourage. And even though he has forgiven you, Elijah can curse you. But you know, doctrinally, you, it looks simple when you start. But that's why you don't fight intercessors. You, a, a man can pray and then he can become part of Elisha's company. And you know, Elisha, when children insulted him, he didn't remember they were children. He said, a beer will devour you. They died. And so if, a, a, if an intercessor that works with Elisha comes into your company and you insult him, he may forgive you, but Elisha will curse you. That's the mystical dimension of the body of Christ. But you know, when we say priesthood, they think it's prayer. So this same subject, I'm trying to keep it basic because when we start talking about dominion, I will teach you what you will do that will make stars to fight for you. Hope you know that in the day of Deborah, when they were fighting, angels were throwing stones at the enemy. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> the realm where we are is a strange realm. Some things are beyond doctrine. But you have to be spiritual to discern them. So for today, we will keep it calm. So we will learn these principles and begin to practice them. Because 99% of Christians are living below standard. What God created us to express and manifest is himself. That means when you look at a man, he is not yet a man until he can manifest God. Men should be known after the dimensions of God that they represent. That's why Paul said, henceforth, before now we knew men after their bloodline. Before now we knew men after their family names. But he said, henceforth, no we not man after the flesh. So if we can't see a dimension of God that you represent, you are not part of the assembly of God. And so dominion will require a lot of mystical possibilities to be enforced. But for the purpose of introduction, I want to begin by explaining to us the principles and the laws that make for dominion. And please, I want you to bear this in mind. You don't have to be an apostle to exercise dominion. You don't have to be a prophet to exercise dominion. You don't have to be male to exercise dominion. You don't have to be educated to exercise dominion. Is it important to be educated? Yes. But the powers that rule this realm are spiritual. And so when you understand the laws that harness those powers, it becomes natural for you to exercise dominion whether you are male, female, whether you are educated, not educated, whether you are in the fivefold or not, it doesn't matter. Because these are the inheritance of the sons of God. And every one of us here today is a child of God or a son of God. And therefore, dominion must become a daily part of our existence. In John chapter 21 verse 25, the Bible said, all that Jesus did were not recorded. And the reason is not because they don't want to record it. But when they attempted to record it, they discovered there is a scarcity of document. They say if all the books in the world are gathered together, it can't contain what he did. So because they couldn't write, every, because when Jesus wakes up in the morning, he wakes up miraculously. When Jesus talks to you, there is a miracle. Sometimes you will reach him, you will not know something has happened. You will go after three days, you will now trace it back. That is when this man touched me, that favor came on my life. Everything about his life was miraculous. And it was so miraculous that they could not write it down. And in John chapter 14 verse 12, Jesus said, Greater works than this shall ye do. That means if, you're li if they write your biography, it means you failed. If there's anybody on earth who can completely write your biography, it means you failed. Because <laughs> you can't write the biography of a spiritual man. Because part of his life is earthly. The bulkier part of his life is heavenly. It's only when you see him from heaven that you can understand his dimensions. Men can attempt to write one or two things about you, but it's a caricature. It's a miniature expression of what you are. Because the day will come when, if you enter a hall, because you breathed oxygen in that hall, everybody in that hall is blessed. <laughs> you don't know we breed on people and demons leave them. That's the realm we operate in. But it takes laws and principles to function in this realm. Just as a way of starting, what is a principle? A principle is a fundamental set of truth. It's a fundamental set of truth upon which systems, beliefs, or behaviors are built. So when you find a belief system, when you find a behavioral pattern, when you find ideologies and methodologies, they don't just exist on their own. There are sets of truth that are at the foundation of every belief system. 
There are sets of truths that are the foundation of every behavioral pattern. There are sets of truths that are the foundation of every manifestation you see. Those unseen set of truths that determines those manifestations are what we call principles. So when you see a man behave in a certain way, there are principles that rule his life. Some of them are consciously imputed, some are unconsciously imputed. But by all means, there are principles that rule everyone. So every man who has a belief system is functioning by a set of truths. Those set of truths are what we call principles. Now, what is a law? Laws are inherent principles. So you see, principles are set of truths that form belief systems. Laws, on the other hand, are inherent or imbibed. Principles that have become a part of you. Inherent principles that regulate the nature of life. So when somebody imbibes a principle until it becomes the nature of his life, that principle imbibed has become a law to that person. So inherent principles that regulate the nature of life and relationship and guarantees fulfillment are laws. So whatever it is that regulates the nature of your existence, whatever it is that governs your relationship, and whatever it is that brings fulfillment to your life has become a law to you. So, these are some of the things we want to look at. The ones scriptures highlight as indicators or parameters for producing dominion. Praise the name of the Lord. Why do we study these principles and these laws? You know, I began teaching you two weeks ago on realms of intimacy. And I told you there are seven realms of intimacy. The first realm of intimacy is to know about God. That does not profit you. It only excites you. The second realm of intimacy is to understand the principles of the kingdom. That will give you an advantage in life. That's what we are trying to consider. The third realm of intimacy is to know God by experience. That one is not necessarily about success in life. That one is about becoming like him. So a man can know Jesus and become like Jesus, but he may fail in life. Even though the third level is more important, the second level should be included because without every contradiction, the less is included in the greater. So when a man knows Jesus and is so much like Jesus but is failing in life, it's because he violated one of the cadres of intimacy. He violated the cadre of principle. So as important as praying to know God is, as important as meditating on scriptures in order to grow in the spirit is, it must reflect in your natural life. It must reflect in your existence. The reason is because if it doesn't, that area of your life where you suffer dominion will become a gate through which the devil will torment you. And the reason many people fall today is not because their love for God is questionable. Make no mistakes about that. They love God to the core. But there are too many openings in their lives that give the devil an advantage over them. So their financial life is porous. Their health is porous. Everything about them is so porous that the devil can buffet them from morning to night. And the point comes when it becomes too much, they break. So if a man wants to really grow in God, he must understand how principles work. So that he puts that part of his life intact and locks those gates away from demons. So that when he begins to press into God, there will be nothing that distracts him. If a man understands the principle, for example, for wealth creation, and he creates a robust wealth system, he can go to prayer for seven days and seven nights. Because while he's yet praying, he's making money. While he's sleeping, he's making money. For such a man, the devil cannot come and distract him with finances. But a man who has not built a financial structure, God may tell him, wait upon me for three days. After the first day, the wife will break the door down and say, if you don't come out, our child will not go to school tomorrow. And even if he tries to pray, he will be hearing school fees, school fees, school fees. If he ignores that child, Around 10 a.m., they will come back from school and they will tell him they drove the child from school. God will be waiting, but he can't see God because he will be distracted. That's why principles, laws are very important because that aspect of our life cannot be ignored. When the devil came to Jesus, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. What does that mean? That means man also lives by bread. There is no man that lives only on the word of God. Every man lives on bread and the word. 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. That means bread is an important aspect of a man's life. And the way to win the battle of, 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 of oppression in life is to understand how dominion works. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, there are four principles that I will, I will share with you now. And then there are six laws that I will give to you now. If you understand these principles, understand these laws and put them to work, happy are you. We don't succeed because things are easy. We succeed because we understand superior laws. Planes don't fly because they become light. Planes fly because they impose a law superior to gravity. That's why they fly. We are not on earth because God kept us here. We are on earth because gravity insists that we should be here. If you remove gravity from here, we will all float from the earth realm. So there are laws that make for things to happen. And so you must know those laws, master those laws, in order to have victory in life. Four principles I want to share with you quickly. Number one is the principle of desire and expectation. These principles are celestial and they are eternal. The reason is because it's not only men that apply them. Even angels apply these principles. When you see men who dominate in life, when you see men who win in life, check them out. Their life is full of irresistible desire and unbreakable expectations. Those expectations are energy generators in the spirit. When a man begins to build desire consciously and generate so much expectation, he even he, he enforces and insists on drawing the attention of spirits. Because even spirits are attracted to people that have desires. Spirits are attracted to people that have strong expectations. So apart from the fact that desires generate energy, desires also provokes the attention of spirits. That's why every man you see winning in life is a man with desires that cannot be taken. It's a man with expectations that cannot be broken. The reason is because if you don't have a spiritual advantage in this life, you will fail. And one of the things that attracts spirits to your atmosphere is the kind of desire you have. Have you seen, have you been to a power meeting before? Where a cameraman stands in front of an anointed person and he's saying, take it. And it looks as if the cameraman is cast with iron. No anointing ever touch him. Has it occurred to you why the cameraman never fall under the anointing? The reason is because they have no expectation of receiving. Their desire is not towards receiving. The attention of the cameraman is to capture the moment. So while you are saying take it, he's trying to get the right angle. His expectation is the angle. Angle is his problem, not receiving. Whereas there's another person at the overflow who is, has made up his mind already that even if the man coughs, I will receive something. For that kind of person, before you say take, he's already under the power. And then you think the cameraman is, is, no, it's not like he's shielded from the anointing. His lack of expectation to receive and his lack of desire to connect to it insulates him from the anointing. That's how life is. When a man doesn't have desire or expectation, even if God is standing with him, nothing will happen around him. Because his lack of expectation will isolate him and insulate him away from God. Have you seen people, they are struggling, they are begging for money every day. But they never generate desire for a, a peaceful life. They never build desire for a prosperous life. They are just thinking of what they will eat tomorrow or eat today. And the moment they have enough to eat today, they say, thank you, Jesus. Ah, you have blessed us. And tomorrow we always take them unawares. But there's another man that is still in primary school. And why he's in primary school, he said he's a president. And from primary school, he's building that expectation, building that desire. It affects the way he dresses. It affects the way he walks. It affects the way he talks. Whether he likes it or not, the forces of nature will gravitate towards him. The spirits will gravitate towards him because they know this man is generating energy that we cannot resist. Did you not read Genesis chapter 18 verse 19? God said, I know Abraham my servant. Seeing that he will be great, I cannot hide anything from him. God perceived that this guy will be great. So a point come. God said, I can't, even if I want to. This guy will be great. There is a level of expectation you build. Demons and angels begin to look for you. 
because your desire and expectation may be intangible in the natural realm, not in the supernatural realm. In the supernatural realm, your desire is an utterance. Your expectation is an utterance. It's like a man knocking and insisting that the door must open. And Jesus said, him that knocketh, to him the door must be opened. Him that seeketh must find. How do you seek in the spirit? You seek in the spirit by creating a desire. You can never be anointed until you have a desire for anointing. You can never be rich until you have a desire to be rich. So there is nothing wrong in having desire for wealth. The only problem is when your motivations are wrong. When a man is talking about wealth, there's nothing carnal about it. The only thing carnal about it is if he's looking for wealth for pleasure. If he's not looking for wealth for something that advancing God's, advances God's purpose, then that wealth is for a carnal purpose. But if the man wants wealth because he wants to improve the lives of people, even God will help him nurture that desire. Have you not read Ephesians chapter 4 verse 20? It says, God is able to do. God is only able to do according to what? What you think or ask. If you don't generate that desire in your mind, God will be limited in your life. Because God can be limited. In Psalm 78 verse 41, the Bible said they limited the Holy One of Israel. Most of you are here asking God to please help you. But you are actually the limitation God is having in your life. You want God to bless you, but you don't have the desire to walk as a great man. You don't have the desire. You are satisfied with your mediocre level. And then you are at that level you think is humility. Mediocrity is not humility. Timidity is not humility. It's a curse from your bloodline. There are many people that you have to kick them into greatness. Because no matter how you tell them, they say no, they don't want to show themselves. And they remain timid, buffeted, and they cannot impact their generation. Because they were never taught that you will only have what you desire. He said, through desire, Proverbs 18 verse 1, a man having separated himself, intermeddles with all wisdom. You cannot break into dimensions until desire separates you to seek it. Spirituality is not just when we gather and we are praying. Some of us want to raise cripples. When I go to my place of prayer, sometimes I sit down and I, I close my eye and see myself raising cripples in stadiums. I see it. If the picture is not coming, I go and look for who has it. And then I go and play Kobus Van Rensburg. I go and play Pastor Chris Yoakilome because I'm trying the picture is not coming. So I literally, mechanically generate a desire. And so as I look at it over and over, I begin to create the desire. And so when I'm going for a healing crusade, me too, I wear my white suit. If you like, call it copying. That is your business. I have seen it. I have desired it. I force my way into it. It's called dominion. And today, like joke, it's happening like water. Two days ago, I was in a movie. In the name of Jesus, growth dematerialized. Somebody called fearfully from the Caribbean because what do they call it now? Fibroid of three years. The stomach was already protruded. The fibroid vanished. It vanished. And when they told me, I wasn't shocked because I've already seen it in my spirit. So when it happens now, I'm not surprised. I'm only surprised when it doesn't happen. And so when I come for a meeting and I pray and nothing happens, I go back to God and say, why didn't it happen? But when it happens, we give God praise. Because we've seen ourselves. You don't know what I've seen myself doing. Oh! Oh my God. Oh my God. If I play, if I play what happens in my head to you, you will run. This Abuja, a day will come, no hall will accommodate us. We will have a meeting in the stadium. We will pay for other halls. People will be streaming. I've seen a day coming when, when we are coming out. It's not only me. It's a squad. A squad. 30 of us, see, 30 will come out. And the moment we come out, cripples will start rising. Everybody will be doing his own thing. Oh my God. <laughs> I have seen myself appear on the altar. It's not, <laughs> you don't know what we think. That's why God is processing us. Because if everything happened now, even we, it will kill us. 
If I come to this hall and it's empty, I will fall sick. I have seen this hall packed. So it cannot but be packed. Because I want to impact people. And it's not just about the crowd. I want to see everybody who comes here. Come back every day with testimony of signs and wonders. It's not just man of God, pray for me, this happened. Man of God, no, 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 no. The usher shows up and said, I was coming, I saw a, a, a cripple at the gate. So I brought him. When you say, where is the cripple? Bring him. You will think they are pushing a witch here. The cripple will throw to the altar. Because he didn't bring him. He walked him into the beauty. Those are the things you see. Because God responds to your desire. Proverbs 10, 24. It said, the desires of the righteous shall be granted. The desires of the righteous. So if the righteous doesn't have desires, there's nothing that will be granted. But if the desire, if the righteous has a desire, then God has found something he will grant. There are too many empty people walking around. And that's why anything that happens to them satisfies them. We thank God for everything we see, but there is more. Because our appetite is big. You can't rule in this world unless you have enormous desires. Find doubt from everybody making impact. The only thing we do is to sanitize it so that it's not selfish. A man who doesn't see himself being big can never be big. It's a principle that every great man knows and they apply it. Why do you think great men are always in solitude? The reason is because you can't generate desire in a noisy environment. So many times you have to leave people, leave the challenge and hide somewhere because you want to incubate on something. And when that desire grows, a point comes. You'll see these things happening and it happens with ease. The reason many people's prayers are not productive is because even when they are praying, the prayer is not imparting on anything. But when a man who has desire lifts his voice and is praying, the prayer has a lot of raw materials to convert to finish goods. Because by desire, he has created a web in his spirit. In Psalm 21 verse 2 It said thou hast given him His heart desire And thou hast not withholding from him The request of his lips You have given him His heart desires People Don't have tangible results And tangible testimonies Because they don't desire nothing In Psalm 145 verse 19 It said he will fulfill The desires of them that fear him there are many people who fear the Lord, but they don't have desires. So even though God appreciates their fear of Him, there's no desire to fulfill. You've got to have extraordinary desires to provoke and to command extraordinary results. I heard Bishop Oedipo made a statement. He said, thank God we are where we are. He said, but we would have been shocked if we are not here. We thank God for where we are. We are grateful about it. But we are not surprised that we are here. We would have rather been shocked if we are not here. Who talks like that? Except a man who through desire have gone into his future and come back to live it. Desire helps you to live the future before you relive it in the natural. But when you have no desire, anything that happens to you, you deserve it. When you see people who are laboring so hard, doing so much, they are trying to meet up with the magnitude of their desire. Too many people have no desires. The second principle that makes for greatness and imparts dominion power is the principle of visualization. These are the real spiritual realities, these ones. If you don't have these ones, your prayer will be a religious prayer. I'm telling you why a lot of people are shallow. They think spirituality is religion. It's a deliberate thing. I was sharing with them two days ago. I told them, 
we who are in the civilization of light are backward. Those who are in the civilization of darkness, they have gone far ahead of us. The things available to us in light are the things they copied. But they have perfected those things in darkness a thousand times more than we that have it originally in light. If witches have meetings now, nobody is budgeting for transport. Everybody will just appear and it's not a miracle. We are dancing and happy that God gave us money. We bought a bus. It's a good testimony. But it means we are in the stone age in the spirit realm. Because according to updated profile in the spirit realm, from 1930, which is come to their meetings by, by location. If you talk about by location now, the whole body of Christ will rise up against you and say, this is heresy. Meanwhile, the Bible said, Enoch, who was seven after Adam, walked with God and was not because God took him. The Bible spoke concerning Elijah in 1 Kings 18 from verse 8 to 11 when Obadiah met him. He said, go and tell Ahab I'm here. Obadiah said, I will not go because I know that the wind will carry you. Elijah was traveling by the wind. We have lost those inheritances because we have not seen deep in the spirit. Meanwhile, witches have preserved this heritage. Every time they come for meeting, they show up. And their meetings, they don't pay for their venues. We are attacking God now that we have paid for our venue. We have been able to pay for one year. LED screen. When they look at us, huh, this is a testimony of, of 1440. This is a testimony of 1419. How come you are giving it in 2022? In 2022, you are still happy. Because we, we, when we build cathedral, oh my God. Come and see dedication. The whole body of Christ will gather. And then the witches are wondering, ah, that means in the spirit we are their elder brothers. Because sometimes when they want to have meeting, they will go to India. There is no immigration that can stop them. They don't need passport. They will have meeting one night and return. The next meeting will be in Greece. The next meeting will be in Pakistan. The next meeting will be in United Kingdom. But see a Christian who goes to the UK. He will snap at the airport and stand like this. God has helped my ministry. If we go to Ghana, we'll stand at the airport like this. God has helped us. I went to Zambia when they welcomed me. I stood like a man of God. They welcomed me at the airport. After laboring in the plane for eight hours, a witch would do havoc in eight hours. He can't sit in one location for eight hours doing nothing. And then when we show up, we stand. Sometimes we even frown to show that we are in the spirit. <laughs> That's the civilization of 1441. We are doing it in 2022. But the problem is what? We don't see beyond our environment. We don't see. We are blinded by civilization. We are blinded by the things happening around us. That's why we are still fighting for dress. Fighting for who is leading choir. Fighting for who, who led prayer. Meanwhile, you led prayer and nothing happened. But you are interested that, that at, uh, during the 20th, part, 20th minute of the prayer, the tongues I was preaching, praying. If you hear those tongues. <laughs> I'm saying this so you understand how dominion works. What are you seeing? What are you seeing and what do you desire? It will determine how far you can travel in this realm. Because the realm is governed by laws. And one of the principles that makes for advancement is the principle of visualization. In Psalm 23 verse 7, he says, as a man thinketh in his heart, as a man sees himself in his heart, he says, so is he. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17 to 18, Paul was admonishing us. He said, I know your circumstances may want to distract you. He said, refuse to look at them. Because when you get to where God is taking you, you will be a commander over those circumstances. So he said, why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things that are unseen. The reason is because we have been able to go away from our light affliction. He said, our light affliction are but for a moment. They work for us an exceeding weight of glory. So refuse for your circumstance to get your attention. Don't let your circumstance become what you focus on. There is something that is higher 
and your circumstances because you will become what you see if you keep looking at the problem you will become part of the problem but when you look away from the problem and look yonder you will bring a technology that will supersede that problem and will make you become a joy of many generations that's why in colossians chapter 3 from verse 1 to 3 he said if we say we are dead in christ he said then our affection our attention should be on the things that are above he's not trying to mentor us into religion He's trying to let us know that there are dimensions above that we should download into this world to dominate this world. If our attention is earthward, we will be regulated by earth. earth. That's why today is the government that determines the progress of the church. If Obasanjo did not bring GSM, till today would have been writing letters. So if the government doesn't go forward, the church will remain backward. If the government shuts down internet now, our live streaming all ends. Our Zoom meetings end. But do you know that the government can't stop the witch that is in your village? If he wants to send the message anywhere, he will send it any day, any time. If they want to have a meeting, if they like, the government should bring any rule. He can't stop them. Because they are seeing Hades. And everything they see in hell, they invent into it. But we can't see beyond it. So we are limited by our sight. And this is why it's important for any man who wants to have dominion to begin to see beyond this environment. Because you can only have what you see. In Genesis chapter 14 verse 13, Abraham wanted to be blessed. And God was trying so hard to bless Abraham. He couldn't. Until God told Abraham, this is the cure. I have told you in Genesis 12 verse 1, I will bless you and make you a father of all nations. Genesis 12 verse 1 to 3. But you can never become a father until you are able to see it. So he said, lift up your eyes from where you are standing. Look towards the north, the south, the east and the west. As far as your eyes can see, I have given to you. So as powerful as God is, he could not make Abraham a father of all nations, even though he had promised. So for that to happen, Abraham must first of all see it. God told Abraham, I will bless you with a child. And God tried and labored and could not. Until in Genesis 15 verse 5, God told Abraham, look up if you can count the stars. He says, so shall thy seed be. And the Bible said, Abraham believed and it was counted to him for righteousness. That was when Abraham became a father of Isaac. Abraham became a father of many nations when he looked up. If you can't see, you can never have. Even if an angel promised you. Even if God promised you. That's why many people receive prophecy. And they come back after six months and say, All these fake prophecies. All these fake prophets. Five of them told me I'll be great. I am seeing where I am. They told you you'll be great, but you are looking down. How can you be great? Did you not read that God told Abraham, I will make you a father of many nations? And Abraham could not. Until Abraham was able to see. This is why your eyes are not meant for casual sight. Job said, I have covenant with my eyes. I will not look upon the virgin. Because Job knows that his reality is a product of what he sees. There are many people here today, they want to be anointed. But every day they are seeing pornography. And when they see pornography, they provoke a desire and nurture the energy. You are, anoint, you are actually very anointed. But it's in darkness. That's why now you have four girlfriends. The utterance you should have used to win souls, you have used them to win women. <laughs> you will have what you see. It's a law. Christians think spirituality is when we come for prayer meeting and everybody is doing hmm, hmm, hmm. That is beautiful. If the Holy Ghost is tearing you, but after you generate that energy, what do you see? What do you incubate upon? That's where the real spirituality lies. If you keep seeing the wrong things, you will pray all your life and you will be a poor prayer warrior. There are many gallant prayer warriors today that are failures. I know them when I was growing up. They wear big plain trousers and sandals. When they are coming to your house, they, their Bible is so big that they wrap it in leather. Because they are prepared under the rain, under the sun, they will preach the gospel. Because they never saw themselves driving in a car. So sometimes when it's raining, they show up. 
with hunger for God. They have hunger for Jesus Christ. And even inside the rain, they show up. Thank God for your hunger. But if you had some wisdom, your hunger would have been packaged. You see them wear one standard for four years. And when they put the standard at your door, you come and look. You will have a body to sow a seed instantly. We are frustrated. And this is not just about ministry. It has to do with your business. You are in that company. Have you seen the sons of the born women? When they come, they come with audacity. They act as if they own this country. Because they have been taught these principles. So they don't take anything for granted. When they are coming for an interview with you, they say it's theirs. They know they will win it. And they talk like that. They see like that. If they come to your area, they are not just looking for a house. After two weeks, they are asking how much do they sell this property. And two people can come to your village. And after six months, they buy the whole land in that area. And then you are wondering what is going on here. They don't see that village as your village. They see it as another settlement of their religion. Our sight is too limited. That's why our manifestation is dwarfed. Who told you you must be connected to the president to be great? The president is not the only authority that be. There are many other authorities and there are many other resources in the spirit that can make for your advantage. But what can you see? See first and allow the rest for God. But many don't see. They only look at their circumstance. When you sit down with some people, you just want to give them money, let them go. Because they will choke your spirit. They sit with you for two hours and they complain for two hours how nothing is working. Nowadays, if people start and say, I, I say, how much is it? This is the much I can help you with. Take. Thank you. Go. Don't choke my spirit. Because some people, if they finish complaining, even you that God is helping, you will now become afraid. Somebody will come and tell you and say, ministry is hard. I started in Ogbomosho. It failed. I went to Lagos. It failed. I now went to the north, thinking that the north is easy. It failed. Nobody can succeed in the... Ah! You don't know that they have planted a seed in your spirit. Don't hear such. Don't see such. Because you are a processor. What you see, you process into existence. That's how you were built. And that's why, if you want to dominate your world, you must become very selective of what you hear and what you see. Only see what works. I don't follow people who are talking. I follow people who have results. You will never hear me quote anybody who is failing. When I quote a man, he knows it and he has lived it. So anything he says has an implication. That's how I see. If I close my eye today to see a man of God, I'm either seeing Bishop Oedeko or I'm seeing Pastor Chris Yakilome. See, there are too many results. And sometimes I look into Paul, I look into Enoch, I look into Moses. I don't have time to. Thank God you are struggling. God will help you. And if I can help you, I will support. But I will never look in your direction. Because you become what you see. You are a lawyer. All your friends are struggling. You are the best among them. When you come, they say, Oh, Dogu. You say, mm. God is, the Lord is helping us. You are about to drown. If you are wise, go and begin to look for a son. Because when you meet a son, he will tell you how he went to court for 25 years and he didn't lose a case. You will now discover that your two years success is nothing. Immediately your appetite will change. Immediately your boundary will change. You will now tell yourself, if this man goes to court for 25 years without losing a case, me too, I will go for 30 years. Somebody tells you, I just closed this case now, they paid me 2 billion. You now say, ah, do they pay 2 billion naira for cases? I thought court cases is to earn 40,000, 50,000. The moment you leave that man, you will conquer 1 million, even though you have not handled it. Because you can now catch it. Your faith can catch it. Too many people are walking about with mediocres. Don't allow sentiment destroy your life. That's the pain of the poor man. That's the pain of the defeated man. He wants to live around people who are, sent who are sentimental. They hold themselves and cry all night. When they finish crying, they go out, two of them, and they drink Gary, and they come back. They sit down, and they say, I love you. I love you. You will die without impact. All this weak life, defeated life, of hanging around people who come and tell you you have tried. Don't worry. It will be better. Get out from that company. There is somebody who is five years younger than you who is shaking his world. That's the man you want to look at. And then when you see him, you ask yourself, does this guy have two heads? 
what is it that makes him do this thing when you come back to what you are doing you will tell yourself thank god for this level but there's more there's more there's more what are you seeing you will become what you see whether you like it or not there's no prophecy that can change it you must become what you see that's why you have to pay the price to see correctly some of us here our biological parents can't be our mentors you don't know you will be sentimental and say but it's my father you will die your father's biggest achievement is, to, is a bicycle and then you come you say ah it's my father what do you want me to do as much as you can bless him honor him but when you finish go and look for the man who is going where your future looks like <laughs> i wish you heard me river flow in your church once again let it on it be seen God told you you will be a president and your father who is a farmer is your mentor you will become the president of all farmers <laughs> you will be president of all farmers there is no sentiment about destiny too many people are defeated in life because of sentiment my father is not a preacher then I will make the mistake of saying my father is my mentor <laughs> what you see is what you become there is no prophecy that can change it it is a principle number three principle of verbalizing These things are so basic that many people miss it. In Mark chapter 11, verse 22, in the preceding verses, they were walking into Jerusalem. <laughs> I'm seeing an Okada rider now that is about to shift. <laughs> There's somebody towards my left here. You are into a cadre business. I'm seeing the person is something just changed in your, in your paradigm, your mental paradigm. You're about to shift. What we say here looks like a joke. If we start sharing testimonies, you will jump. When we came here, the person who is a, who used to, his job is to, he's been in Abuja for years, but his job is to go and look for those who need equipment he will now go and tell those who have it and then he will collect the contract, the people will supply he will give them the money and take it stipend he has worked with us for two months, he has started his company he is no longer a marketer he is now a CEO of a company what we are saying is not joke we know it tomorrow morning I will be going to dedicate somebody who started an industry all the machines have been imported. You will be complacent until you hear things that challenge you. That's why some of us are 25. We say when we are 40, we'll be millionaires. Who told you it's age that makes a man a millionaire? You were taught wrongly, so you see wrongly. The third principle of dominion is the principle of verbalization. And so in Mark 11 verse 22, Jesus told them, have the God kind of faith. He said, if you say to this mountain, that means if you don't talk, that mountain will remain there forever. God can be living in your house, but the mountain will be there forever. Welcome. Please sit down. How are you doing, sir? He said, if you say to this mountain, be thou removed, and you do not doubt in your heart, you will have whatsoever you say. Jesus didn't say, tell God about the mountain. That means mountains will remain in your life or mountains will be cleared from your life whether you talk or you don't talk. So why some people are removing mountains, others are planting mountains. Because if your walls will remove mountains, it means your walls can plant mountains. It is not possible. It is not going to work. We will fail. You don't know that you have been planting mountains in your path. Because if you command the mountains, they will go. And if you command the mountains, they will go. Then if you command the mountains, they will also come. 
So there are many people today that have planted too many mountains on their path because they only say the wrong things. That's why the Bible says, let no man in Zion say, I am sick. He didn't say no man in Zion will be sick. He knows there are some who can be sick. He said, but let no man in Zion say, I am sick. Why is that so? Isaiah 44 verse 26. He said, I the Lord, I confirm the words of my servants. I perform the counsels of my messengers. Listen to me. Even if I was dying on a sick bed today, if you meet me, I will tell you we don't die. I will tell you we don't fall sick. I will tell you we cannot be sick. Because God is committed only to what I say. And so I wouldn't use my words to shut God out of my ecosystem. He said, I perform the words of my servants and I confirm the counsels of my messengers. In Isaiah 43 verse 26, he said, put me in remembrance of my word. He said, according to your words, you will be justified. You think God is not aware of the hardship? You think God is not aware of the struggle? You think God is not aware of the failure? Okay, now that you have confessed only the wrong things, how has that helped you? When you see men who rule, they never make mistakes with words. Words are too important. In fact, if you say the wrong things to them, they will not keep quiet and go. They will respond to you, dear, before they go. If you make a mistake and say, this thing may not work, they will not say, that's your opinion. They will tell you, it must work. Because they understand the power of words. That's why Jesus said, there's no idle word in this kingdom. Every word you speak, you will account for it. Because you contribute either positively or negatively to creation. Let eternity be seen. River flow. River flow. Some people want to describe their circumstance. And in attempt to describe it, they heap all the negation on themselves. When God came into the world, Moses was watching what was happening from wherever it is that God kept it. And Moses said, the earth was void. Genesis 1 verse 2. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God had been brooding upon the darkness. Why didn't God make mention of it once? He said the spirit of God was brooding upon the deep. God never spoke about the darkness once. When God wanted to speak, he was focused at saying only what he wanted to see. Light be. If Moses didn't write Genesis, if it was God that wrote Genesis 1, you will never know about darkness. Because he will never mention it. He knows how the systems work. What you say is what you have. Too many people have heaped evil on their own path. You check some people's vocabulary. I am sick. It will not work. I will die. It's a thousand times more than it will work. I cannot be sick. I will not die. Some of us are rugged and dogged about this. If you like, kill yourself. Go and carry a babala and curse me. I will stand and say, it can't happen. On these matters, I am not careful to answer you. I am not whatever you, whoever you think you are. There is one of the greatest patriarchs of the faith in this country. Bishop David Oedepo went to see him. And he told him, you are not called. I know you didn't know the story. A man that everybody look up to, you are not called. Bishop Oedepo stood up. <laughs> it's God that calls a man, not a man. <laughs> Today, he doesn't need to explain it to anybody. Do you know how people grow? Words can make or mar you. That's why I tell people all the time you are the first prophet over your life. Don't wait for a great prophet to come and say, Ah, I'm seeing that you are an apostle. <laughs> you will suffer because you may not meet that prophet until you are 65 years old. Verbalization. Too important. Principle number four. Energy balance. Energy. 
The kind of energy you carry per time matters. I quoted already for you from Ephesians 4.20. It said, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above what you ask or think. He now added something. He said, according to the power that is at work on your inside. If you don't carry a, an energy that is consistent with what you want to see, you will never have the result. The people in the world understand this and they apply it well. They call it morale. So when they are going to play a football match, they gather themselves and they tell themselves why they will defeat the opponent. They tell themselves why the opponent is not a match. They tell themselves why they will, they will win this match. What they are doing is that they are trying to configure themselves into the right energy. Because if you enter that field with the wrong energy, even though you are more powerful, you will be destroyed. In the days of old, when kings go to war, if the army is arrayed, they bring orators. And when the orator is done talking, what he will do is that he will so charge them up that even though the army they are going against is five times greater than them, they will charge into that army and it will appear as if nothing happens. If you study the Bible in Joshua chapter 7, when Israel was going to fight AI, in fact, the army of Israel said that AI is a walkover. That with just 2,000, 3,000 men, they will take AI. But because Achan erred against God, what God did was to reduce their morale. They went to that battle. When the nation turned against them, they ran. And they killed them. They ran back to their own camp. Because if your energy is wrong, your results will be wrong. If your energy is right, your results will be right. When you start talking about energy, Christians will tell you it's new age. It's new age theology. That you are using their words, you are using these are realities in the spirit. These men just came to understand it, they didn't create it. If you are going for an interview and you don't have the right energy, you will be shocked, you will fail before you start. That's why many times we worship God, we pray in the spirit, we hear testimonies, we tell ourselves things. What we are trying to do is to summon the right energy. If I'm coming for a miracle service, I won't start talking like this. It's not because the anointing of my life changed, but the energy I come into the meeting will matter. If I'm coming for a revival meeting, I won't start talking like this. I will talk from a different energy level because the result I want to achieve is different. I'm a, I, I came here to talk to you about foundations. That's why I kept myself calm. If I come for a revival service, if my energy is not right, I can worship here for 30 minutes until my energy is corrected before I start talking. Because I know beyond the words, there is an energy that is communicated. Every man who is victorious sustains the right energy. That's why you see the wealthy spending money in luxury. It's not just because they love it. They want to sustain a level of confidence and energy. So they buy the car that nobody has. The reason is because when they come out of that car and they look around, it reminds them that they are bigger than everybody. They are called goose of ostentation. They don't just buy it because they love luxury. If a wealthy man is coming for this meeting, he will make sure that he comes when everybody is seated. So that when he walks in, there is a way he walks in. When they are leaving the meeting, he will drive out when everybody is outside. When he's coming for a conference, it is oga. Don't think with things that happen is a joke. It's not a joke. When you see them coming, they drive four cars. And when the cars park, poor, poor, the way they even break is to arrest the attention of everybody. Then four bodyguards come out here, four come out here. And then they open the door. Everybody's on black suit with, with black glasses. Then the man will appear with a different color. He will never wear the same color with the bodyguard. And then when he steps down, there's a way he walks. If he doesn't carry that energy, he can't control everybody. They know how these things work. It's only a poor man that throws in and says, God is helping us. Well, there'll be anything. Even they, they are walking like this. <laughs> you are joking. When you now say, come up to the platform, then you start shivering. Me? Why me? What? what? You now come up and say, you know, the kingdom of God suffered so violence. The violence, take it by force. Even those who came to the meeting with expectation, when they see you, they'll say, Kai, I should not have come for this meeting today. 
You need to see us when we go for crusade. I wear nothing but white suit. And every other person coming with me wear different colors. And when you show up, you walk into the meeting. You come like the person with the solution. And the moment they see you, the atmosphere changes. The morale changes. It's deliberate. It's called walking some miracles. They are walked. And you need to arrest and calibrate their expectation. Calibrate their morale before you come up. When you come into such meetings, you keep quiet. And when you walk, you walk with the weight of the anointing. And then when you sit down, you are first of all quiet. <laughs> Even the cripple is waiting for you to say, stand up. You have stirred him. That's how it works. There are mysteries in the spirit. Many don't know it. Why do you think when you go for political rally, they wait until the stadium is full? They are actually calling the governor and the president that the stadium is not yet full. Wait. When the stadium is full, then they drive in. And when they are driving in, they don't park where others park. They drive to the stage. The moment they come, everybody starts shouting. You will literally feel that thing come on you. You will feel it. That's how you rule. You must be conscious to create your energy. Do you know why we worship? Do you know why we pray? We are trying to sustain an energy level. Because sometimes the news you hear want to choke you. Sometimes fear wants to choke you. You rise above it. And when you carry the right energy, you come into a place, you create the change. Everybody making impact knows this. Whether in light or in darkness. Only Christians don't. Only Christians don't. You want to have dominion? You must understand these principles. All the laws I'm about to teach you now, they work within the atmosphere of these principles. There are six laws I will give you quickly before we close. What I'm sharing with you today is not something to hear and be excited. It's something to take with you and practice. When next you are going to walk, don't throw into the walk and carry your shoe in the bag and wear you pass. When you reach, you say, sorry, I'm late. You drop your seat. Your boss will trivialize you. When you rush from home, when you come into the, the office, stop. Take your time. Breathe in and breathe out. Let anxiety go down. Do your makeup afresh. If you are wearing a tie, adjust it. Wear your shoe. And when you come down, change your posture. That's how kings walk. When you walk into that office, even your boss who wants to talk to you carelessly, he will, will adjust himself and speak with respect. Dominion is deliberate. It's walked. I talk to you like this because I want to help you. When you throw in carelessly, they will underrate you. Don't you know this thing we are doing here? If we don't put ourselves in order, somebody can walk into this place, I want to underrate you. And say these people are young people. You don't dare think like that. If I stand before you, you will know that a ruler is standing. You will know. Nobody will tell you. You will know. <laughs> it's a deliberate thing. And it's not about money. You can have one shirt, one trouser. Before you go out, even if it's around 11 p.m., wash it. Blow it until it dry. Iron it. When you are going out, talking, stand with confidence. Nobody knows how many. Unless you tell them. That's how you rule in life. The day of timidity, the day of mediocrity is over. Some of you enter relationships. The first one week they respected you until they discover you are common. And then the guy who will open door for you, the guy who will call you and speak with courtesy, Suddenly you call and say, how are you? It's not because your beauty changed. You discovered you don't have gravity. You don't have gravity. Don't trivialize yourself. They say you are a king and you are a priest. And there is a code that governs princes. Don't trivialize yourself. You can be selling leave in the market. You will do it with honor. You can be selling steel pass. You will do it with dignity. Because the value you place on yourself is what people will address you with. When you take yourself for granted, nobody will take you serious. But the way it starts is with the energy you carry on your inside. 
These are principles that regulate life and brings about dominion. This is not new age. These are the principles of the kingdom. Did you read about Jesus? Jesus was about to enter the city. They trekked all the way for days. When they came close to Jerusalem, Jesus coupled himself and waited. He said, go into the city and look for a court. Bring it to me. <laughs> See you. <laughs> Why didn't he trek into the city? Why didn't he trek? He waited. He said, get one that has not been ridden by any man. He said, when they ask you, tell them, the master has need for it. The master. Who is the master? When you hear the master, you may think it's Herod. And because you don't want to enter a problem, you will leave it quietly. Whether it's by the anointing, whatever it is, you, you will withdraw yourself. And when he showed up, he was riding into the city. People were dropping their garments, dropping palm fronts. They said, stop these people. Why are you behaving like this? I thought Jesus would have ignored them. Jesus said, even if they stop, he said, the stones, the stones will rise. The people, <laughs> they, went, they went back. Strange things. He knows how it works. That's why it's called walking of miracles. If I come here for a miracle service with jean and shirt and say I'm anointed, I stroll in. And I say, you know, Jesus wants to heal us today. Ah! Those who don't know you before will say, is that the man of God? Ha! Ah, why did you bring suffer me to come here? You will have to exercise the atmosphere and help their faith before they are able to release. But there's a way you walk into the beauty. Your appearance alone helps their faith. It's a deliberate thing. It's called energy. Many people will not teach you. This is what they do. When you see men of God and they record them by mistake at the back. You see them talking, shaking hands when they are about walking into the hall. They couple themselves. And then some will walk in like this. Have you ever seen a man of God snap like this? When they are snapping. Do you think it's spirit posture? They can be joking if they want to snap. How many men of God do you see on poster? <laughs> they are called the mysteries of dominion. That's why for those of you who are too casual, life takes you for granted. Because you approach life with the wrong energy. This is not manipulation. You condition yourself until it becomes your status quo. Because there's a, there's a code of nobility. There are things kings don't do. Have you ever seen your governor driving and the convoy stop and he say, I want to ease myself. You are walking everywhere. You stop by the gutter. You stop by the market. You say you want to ease yourself. And you say you will be a governor. You are mighty on your throne. You reign. You ancient Zion's king. Kadosh. Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. You reign. You reign. You reign. these things you've got to learn it and you've got to apply them my people know nobody will make if you wear a t-shirt and climb here that's the last time you will climb unless an angel appear to me and say allow him you wear a t-shirt or a jean you, you, you climb here to address people we are kings he said to raise sons priests and kings even if it's a midweek service, there's a code of dressing. You come here carelessly, that's the last time. That means you have not discerned the altar. You will never catch me wear t-shirt preaching. Never. 
unless I'm forced into the meeting and it's not my environment. It's not just fire, fire. Hey, I fell down, I fell down. A church is called a gate. It's where senators gather. Lawgivers assemble here. That's the meaning of ecclesia. How many senators do you go see going to the house of assembly with, with t-shirt? And if the people of the world understand it, is he here will come and learn and be joking? No. Never find yourself going out and dress casually. You are wearing silk pass. You say, it's just five minutes. Who told you it's five minutes? You can meet the man that will change your destiny forever. And because he saw you with Sander, he will need an angel to talk to him and the angel may not be there. I heard the story of some young men who went for IT. And every day they keep sending the other boys. And they got offended. I said, why are you not sending this one? The boss said, don't you see how he's dressed? Do you see a man wearing suit and send him to buy biscuit and pure water? Don't you see how he's dressed? <laughs> you can come for a conference where you two are guest ministers. They say, please lock that door. You say, what? Are you not aware that I'm a guest minister? Well, we didn't notice the way you came. <laughs> we didn't notice. You don't have to labor to introduce yourself five times. Come up like a king. And even those who don't know you, we, we relate with you with respect. Please sit down. <laughs> Six laws. I've shown you the principles. The laws work within these principles. You know, the people of the world call these things packaging. I went to a mechanic village some years ago to buy water. And I entered the shop. I said, give me pure water. I said, it's 15 naira. I said, what? Pure water is 15 naira. He said, the shop there, they sell it for 10 naira. Go there. Ah! I've never been bewildered like that in my life. Is this how you treat customers? You do, so you, we are not under pressure to sell the water. Our water is different. And that's where everybody's buying from. You come to a street, they say these people are babbing, they are cutting people's hair for 1,000. Everybody's going there. And the next shop, they are cutting people's hair for 200 naira. Nobody's, because that one is more organized. You assume that these babas are not ordinary babas. You think life is casual. You joke, you will grow old in penury. And it will not fulfill your destiny. Don't you know there are many people raising the dead? They are still somewhere far at the bush. Nobody knows them. You can't make impact until you put yourself together. Some people think it's just anointing, it's power, fire. You are joking. There are many ministries that have no anointing to show, but they are addressing kings because they are organized. No king wants to go somewhere. Have you not seen most of these ministries that is power, power every day? They come to church. They are singing praise and worship. Somebody will dance from the back, carry chair, and come to the front, and they say the power of God is here. Ah, ah. You want to see a king? Come and sit there. Even if you are raising the dead, they will come. The moment they get their solution, they go back to where people sit down, like reasonable people. Start praise and worship. The whole choir people will be dancing, running about. Somebody will run from the back and say, Wamulele, Wamulele, Every two months, membership change. Because when they get their solution, they go. When they get their solution, they go. There is a way man was created. He was created as a king. And so he must function by the codes of nobility. You can be in business. You can be in the academia. You can be in ministry. The energy you work with is very important. Any rich man who wants to help you today, no matter how he loves you, he will tell you, send the proposal. He wants to see how you think. He wants to see how organized you are. And some people are trusting God for a contract. They don't know how to write a proposal. Lord, I'm looking for a job. Where is your CV? When you look at it, you say, is this a CV? Some people's CV is written with Byron. And they are fasting on the mountain for 40 days looking for a job. 
We don't have time. Ah, 8 o'clock. 10 minutes. The first law. I will just run through this. I will teach about them one after the other. Because it's a series. It will take about 6 weeks. I'll talk about financial dominion. I'll talk about dominion by prayer. I'll talk about dominion by faith. I'll talk about dominion by the word. And all of that. But this is just general introduction. The first principle, the first law of dominion is the law of sowing and reaping. This is not primarily money. What you give is what you have. In this life, you are entitled to receive to the measure of your contribution. Be it ministry, be it business. The level of impact you make is what determines your return. People respond to you based on your impact. So life is programmed in such a way that the level of your impute is what will determine the level of your output. There are many people today who are not imputing anything to life, anything to their world. And they are hoping that one day an angel will appear in their room and throw a bag of money. That is calm. They will come to certain places, they exaggerate testimonies to make people lazy. Don't be part of that generation. Thank God for miracle money. Thank God for miracle whatever is called. But go and check how many people have it. In a church of 10,000 people, 10 people, 5 people have a miracle. And you want to live your life on that economy. That an angel gave somebody money is a fact that is possible. But we were not created to receive money from angels. There is a law of sowing and reaping. If you don't sow, you can't reap. Jesus himself said, the measure with which you give is the measure with which you will be given. The measure with which you met out is the measure that will be met unto you. So any word where you find yourself, you must pay the price to increase value. Because people respond to you based on the value you give. It's not about shouting. It's beyond shouting. When you talk to people, how does it impact their world? Is the extent to which you impact their world that will make them impact your own world. People are not just favored. I know we teach favor, but we exaggerate things. Somebody will wake up and tell you, if favor rubs off on you, ah, every day of your life, you will be receiving. Go and find out the person who is receiving every day of his life, how many thousand people is impacting. Somebody tells you, I am favored every day, somebody dash me something. Find out how many million people he's impacting. If you have no impact, the favor may be running like a river. It's only your family members that will see it. Make no mistakes about it. Things are taken out of context. Things are exaggerated. One person receives a car by favor. And then the car becomes the doctrine of the church for one year. Every service, the car, the car, the car. We thank God for the car. We testify to stir the faith of others. But we know this thing is beyond the miracle. Because the moment they enter the promised land, the man has stopped flowing. You've got to make up your mind and tell yourself, I must make positive impact. You are in the academia. What is your impact there? What you receive there will be commensurate to your impact. You are in the business world. What are you producing? You are producing nothing. You are adding nothing. You are loafing around. And you are hoping that because you speak in tongues, God will just lift you up. If he's lifting everybody up like that, who will be the farmer? Who will be the trader? Who will do the hard work? There is a place of favor. There is a place of the blessing. But there are underlying laws that make for these things to happen. You reap what you sow. You receive to the degree of your impact. That's the significance of that law. If you have no impact, your life will be an average life. Take that from me. You may not accept it. When you are 80 years old, you will tell yourself the truth. Don't lazy around. You hear that this, this, this prophet, everybody is sowing to him. They gave him a car. Go and find out what he has done that he has not said. You see this businessman, they tell you, even while he's sleeping, he's making money. And then motivational speakers will come and put one kiosk. 
And say, even if you start with one kiosk, you'll make it. It takes a lot of hard work underneath. It takes a lot of investment underneath. Nothing happens by chance. We have too many lazy believers. I was sharing with one sister recently. Most sisters don't want to marry brothers anymore. Because when they show up, all they have to show is tongues. An angel appeared to me yesterday when I was on the 70 days fast. <laughs> Thank God for your 70 days fast. But life is beyond the 70 days fast. The Lord told me you are my wife. What are you doing? And then you find a sister who is doing well in business. Suddenly marries a, 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 a fasting machine. And when the lady marries him, that fasting that he's talking about bogus thing, he will not talk again. Every day he comes to his wife's shop and say, um, you know, the work of the Lord, the king's business requires his. And the husband in this union, this is what God said, do this, you are a scam. You are a thief. Why do you think many young ladies are not married? Because all our brothers only have tongues. When you finish speaking that your tongue, what impact do you have? You marry these ladies and you swindle them of all their monies. A lady that was doing well, you meet her after two years of marriage, she becomes a shadow of herself. Because the husband has run down the whole shop. And the same applies to some sisters. They wake up with makeup, their skin is glowing like electric bulb, and that's all they have. Brain empty, no commitment to anything. Some can't even cook. They lie down from morning to night. They're on WhatsApp and Facebook, snapping for Instagram. You will never dominate this realm until you have something that impacts this realm. Dominion is a function of impact. I can, I can speak the tongues of Bishop Oedipo. And that's because I'm, I'm a preacher. If I was to be a politician, <laughs> ah, by now, maybe I would have been working with the president. The kind of initiative I would have put together. This period that the world is going through turbulence, I would have had NGOs. By now, I would have coordinated youth across the country. If I talk, it's gospel that shut me down. I, I, I sat down, I listened to Obama for two years. Every speech he has on YouTube. I listened to Winston Churchill. I, I listened to Plo Lumumba. World-renowned orators and influencers. If I was in business, I would have gone to serve Cosmos Madoka for free. Because I must contact something. I'm not here to receive bread. I want to make bread. I'm not here to receive fish. I want to catch. Because you are relevant to the degree of your impact. Don't lazy around and you speaking in tongues to cover up. What do you know? What can you offer to your generation? The love of sowing and re receive re and reaping. We insist that you go nowhere. Because when something wants to happen to you, that law will check and balance. Because if it doesn't happen, you will be robbing your generation. Who told you you just speak in tongues and they will give you seed of one million? Who told you that? <laughs> you were deceived. Anything you want to receive consistently that you don't have impute on ground that is commensurate to, the law will rise up against you. And say, if you give this guy this thing consistently, you will create an imbalance in nature. It will not happen. And so a man who wants to walk consistently in a dimension must consistently begin to sow. That's why he said, give a portion to seven. Give a portion to eight. You know not the evil that will come upon the earth. In the morning, sow thy seed. In the evening, withhold not thy hand. Sowing is a law because it controls what you reap. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 20 to 22, when the new world was created, God was speaking to Noah. He said, seed time and harvest. Sowing and reaping. Cold and heat. Summer and winter. 
shall not cease. These are laws. When you see things happening to people, don't just say, God is kind towards that person. So God is harsh to you. And you are still alive. God is kind to everyone that calls upon his name. People are functioning at the level of their impact. And if you want to go higher, you've got to begin to sow and make impute to your world. These things are not taught believers. We come, we pick one testimony, we exaggerate it, and we enslave a hundred thousand people. The second law of dominion is the law of consistency. In Luke chapter 18 from verse 1 to 5, when Jesus was teaching on prayer, he said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. And he gave an instance of a woman, a poor widow, who had no advantage. And then he also spoke about a wicked king that neither feared God nor man. He said, but day and night, this widow troubled this wicked king. And he said, in order for the king to have peace, he went and solved her problem. And he said, if this unjust king will do this, how much more? That means, this cruel man that has no regard for God, because he was consistently buffeted, he had no choice. That means there is an energy that consistency generates. When a man is doing something consistently, he's generating a particular kind of energy in the spirit. It's not a joke. The reason many people don't make impact is that they are too quick to give up. So when you come into their lives, every day they are trying something new. They try A, they try B, they try C. Even the people of the world know things don't work like that. They call them jack of all trade, master of none. Is there anything you have done in your life for 10 years? Is there anything you have done in your life for 15 years? There is no way that thing will not produce result. Because when you become consistent, you knock on a gate in the spirit. There are spirits that respond to consistent people. Whether in light or in darkness. We don't have capacity and resilience. That's why many times we don't make impact. The guy starts doing it when he's about to transit. He gets tired, he goes, and he starts something new. They are always being innovative, but they are never completing anything they start. That's why they never make true impact. Every man making impact in this world today is a consistent person. And you want to find the character of a great man. Don't look at his demeanor. Find out his stamina and tenacity on the things he lays his hand to do. It's like growth. No matter how many times you jump, you will come down. But if you grow, you remain. That's how consistency works. You may be doing it one at a time. But if you don't give up, a day will come, you become a master. It was Bruce Lee that said something. He said, I'm more afraid of a man who can punch once in 1,000 days than a man who can punch a thousand times in one day. There are many people, if they come to pray today, they can pray for 15 hours. All their clothes will be wet. You look at them and say, Jesus Christ, what manner of grace is this? The next time they will come to the prayer altar, will be in two months. But there's another man who prays 30 minutes. But every day, you know that that 30 minutes, he will plug it in. That man is a thousand times more powerful than the guy who hit and run. Every person making impact in this kingdom has a signature of consistency. If you don't find consistency in a man's life, no matter how gifted he is, give him time, he will fail. But when you find a man who is consistent, even if he doesn't have any gift, watch out. After many years, you will be shocked what the guy will do. Consistency is a weapon of success and a weapon of preservation. It's good to start new things. But make sure you finish every other old one you were doing. Don't keep starting things and never finishing anyone. You've got to be consistent on things. There are certain people that even in their relationship, every three months they start a new relationship. The moment that somebody shouts, relationship has ended. 
you see them, they have a heartbreak. After one week of heartbreak, they have started another relationship. They have not even healed from the last one. After three months, you see them with a new guy. They say, that last guy, don't mind that idiot. Don't mind him. He's a very unreasonable person. I tried everything to make it work. For how long? Three months. And the same character manifests in their business. Joseph was interpreting dreams all his life. He interpreted a dream. It provoked jealousy. He kept interpreting. He interpreted another dream. He was in the prison. He kept interpreting. A day came when he interpreted one dream that made him the lord of Egypt. He would have stopped interpreting dream and said, the last time I interpreted, he gave me problem. He was consistent. When a man is consistent, there is no height he will not scale. We have too many inconsistent people. Some is even visions that kill them. You see this man in January. He has a vision. He tells you, God told me to go to Congo. Ah, I'm wasting time here. I'm wasting time here. I'm wasting time. You now encourage him. Okay, if that's what God is saying, why not we take two months and pray about it? Say, no! I saw this vision. I was carried to a mountain. Meet that man after four months. The man that God told to go to Congo will now tell you, God said we should go and bring down the mantle of Islam in Meduguri. In four years, he has four contrasting visions. One is going north, one is going south. So the only way he can fulfill destiny is when you tear him into four. So the only way he will fulfill destiny is when he dies. He will fulfill it from heaven. Inconsistency have destroyed great visions. Did you not read about great men? What do you know about Bill Gates since you were born? His name is synonymous to Microsoft. They stay on one thing. And as they stay on it, there is no way they will not be celebrated. What do you know about Mother Teresa? She was in a remote village in India. No media there. Serving the poor. Serving the poor. A day came, the whole world began to celebrate her. She was not raising the dead. She was not doing miracles. She was just there fetching water for the poor. Money comes, she gives to the poor. And she kept at it from her youth until she was an old woman. But a day came, she was celebrated. Did you read about Billy Graham? In the days of Billy Graham was the evolution of the prophetic and the miraculous. The man stayed on salvation. 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 His name was included among the six people that changed the last century. There's no preacher that is there. In his generation were many miracle workers, many prophets. Some of them traveled around the world. This guy was just preaching salvation. Salvation. There was no miracle. There was nothing spectacular. But he kept at it. And by doing that simple thing, how, how many... This man is a man of deep revelation. If he starts talking now, you'll be shocked. How many revelations can you get from John 3.16? There is, the whole revelation is there. And even a child of five years will see the whole revelation. But somebody preached John 3.16 for 74 years. What was he preaching? He wasn't preaching a message. He was consistent. The consistency was a power in the spirit. And the day came. Presidents upon presidents will submit to him. When they come to him, it's not word of knowledge. And say, mm, I saw in the spirit, you will win the next election. No word of knowledge. He never prayed for somebody that had headache. But presidents kept coming to him. When he died, where they placed his cup, cups is where they placed the dead body of American presidents that died in office. No American has that level of honor by preaching salvation. Today we want to kill ourselves in doing many things. There is no consistency. You started last month in selling spare parts. When your friend who went to the U.S. now said, I have a brother in Nigeria who sells spare parts. I want to help him now. When they came back, you are now into electronics. They now say, okay, maybe God is leading him. As they say, okay, let's see what we can do around electronics. Before they finish the research and came back, you are now into tourism. You are taking tourists. You are a tourist guide. That's why they never make impact. I'm telling you, these things happen with Christians. 
with all the speaking in tongues, with all the gifts of the Spirit, not making impact because of these foundational issues. I don't have time to press. The third law is the law of focus. Matthew 6, 24. You cannot serve two masters. You can't look up and down at the same time. There are many people who are distracted by attempting to do too many things at the same time. As I'm preaching now, that brother on that camera, I can assure you, he's not hearing 20% of what I'm sharing. His only priority now is to make sure if I go to the left, the camera goes to the left. If I go to the right, the camera goes to the right. That's his job. If he wants to be blessed by this message, he will hear it again. Because if he takes his focus from there and says, My God, this Rema, I will be there. This stage will be empty on the internet. <laughs> the guy who is doing the live stream now, his focus is to regulate sound. When I start shouting, he will reduce the volume. And when my voice goes down, he will increase the volume. If not, if he now says, My Jesus, he will now stand up and stand like this. God, what is happening here? The people online will be shouting, No volume, no volume, no volume. This is, this is one minute distraction will result in chaos on the internet. That's what's happening to most of us because there's no focus. Too many areas of our lives are suffering. We are too gifted. Our gift becomes our undoing. Jesus had definite focus. In 1 Kings 20 verse 39, the prophet told the king a parable he said, my Lord gave me a slave to keep. He said, but as I was busy here and there, I lost him. That's how many people lose destiny. They are busy here and there. There's no focus. When you lose focus, you lose value. When you lose value, you lose impact. He said, let your eyes be single. Then your body will be full of light. That means the light you require for your destiny. It's not a product of owning something on you. It's a product of focus. The moment you start focusing, light begins to grow in your spirit. As a science student, there was something we learned in, in, the, in our days of science in secondary school, SS2, when we started doing optics. There are lenses they call converging lens. They are shaped in a certain way. If you hold a converging lens and set it at the right angle, the converging lens will convert the light of the sun and it will set a black object on fire. The, fire. the thing will start burning. That means the capacity to set your world on fire is in you. The capacity to blow your world open is in you. The capacity to make the greatest impact in your world is already in you. But the ability to bring that energy into your world will be a product of focus. The more you focus, the more you generate energy. Too many people are distracted. That's why they can't make impact. In John chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, when they saw Jesus walking wonders, they said, truly, this is the prophet that shall come. Now, see the benevolence of the people towards Jesus. They wanted to catch him and make him a king. And Jesus ran away. I didn't come into the world to be a king. I came into the world for a definite purpose. And in John 18, 37, Jesus will reply, Pilate, for this, for this reason was I born. For this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. He was so focused that he refused to be distracted by kingship. There are some of us here that God told us, go to a bar and learn how to buy materials and sell. Your friend now came and said, there's a, there's a window to the Bahama Island. You say, I've never gone abroad. Though. This is my only opportunity. It's an opportunity if it is part of your destiny. If it is not part of your destiny, even if it's coronation, it's a distraction. Jesus knew it. That was why even when they wanted to make him a king, is it bad to be a king? No. But it's not part of his curriculum. What is a slipper seller going to do in Bahama Island? Are you going to swim in a blue beach? Is that part of slipper's decoration? Many people, what they call open doors, are distraction away from their destiny. When you don't have focus, you will definitely fail. It may not be now, but just give it time. You will fail. Did you not read about the apostles? 
in Acts chapter 6 from verse 4, it's not meet for us to give ourselves to tables. It says we'll give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the world. We know it's a legitimate thing to do to take care of widows, but that's not part of our curriculum. That it is necessary, that it is important, does not mean it's your responsibility. It's not every important thing that is part of your responsibility. You must discern your calling, discern what God has called you to do, and stay there. You cannot be, you cannot be called into politics, and then you come to church, you say you must be part of the intercessors. And these intercessors, they pray for seven hours every day. How do you combine that? You say, no, no, we must change this world. We must change. Your eye, you, you change the world from your throne. There are those God has called to change the world from the altar. Your zeal will kill you. It's praying good, yes. But what you are called to do does not have enough allowance for you to be an intercessor or the head of the intercessors. So even positive things destroy people. Because they don't know these things. So they don't know what to focus on. How can a banker come and say she wants to be the church administrator? And say, no, God, Jesus first. Seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom is not an activity in church. It's a hard posture. People have no focus. That's why there's no impact. There are certain ministries where they literally shut everybody down. On Monday, prayer is from 9 to 2. On Tuesday, prayer is from 9 to 2. On Wednesday, prayer is from 9 to 2. And they say, no, we, the world is in darkness. We, we, we need to fight in the spirit. That's why such ministries, only secondary school students can manage. Is prayer important? Yes. But we need to give allowance. Because people must focus on what they are called to do in order to be relevant. The law of focus. What focus will do for you is that focus will bring you into mastery. And only masters can rule their world. What you don't focus on, you can never master. That's why those who do too many things never succeed at anything. Focus. 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 Find out what God has told you to do. Stay there. Don't bother about the speed somebody else is enjoying. Stay there. And see what God makes out of your life. You will be shocked if you can stay. In the days of T.L. Osborne, there were three friends. Kenneth Hagin, T.L. Osborne, and Nora Roberts. T.L. Osborne was doing tent meetings. And healings were happening by the number. People traveled from nations to come for those tent meetings. Or a robot. Meanwhile, the Osborne was traveling to every nation of the world. If the Osborne lands, presidents receive him. His meetings were only in stadium. Stadiums were packed because the Osborne was coming. Kenneth Hagin was in a tent, teaching and writing books. But these men were wise. Everybody stayed on their lane. If Kenneth Hagin said, it's those who are traveling from nation to nation that are succeeding, he would have finished the ministry. Twenty years later, every known pastor has read at least one book of Kenneth Hagin. I can assure you that few men of our generation have heard one message of T.L. Osborne. But I can also tell you how that almost every pastor in this generation has been discipled by Kenneth Hagin. Because why God called the lost one to travel around, God was sending Kenneth Hagin into the future. He discerned it and he stayed there. Many people have been distracted from their calling because they have no focus. They are under pressure. God tells you to sell sleepers. Your brother is selling tire and is making money. If you are sure this is what God says to do, master it. Master it. And from there you can upgrade to many other things. But you can never gain mastery until you have focus. And this is not against diversification. But in any diversification that takes you away from the central calling is a distraction. You diversify by improving and increasing on the central core. You don't diversify by leaving the central core to start new things. Focus. 
The fourth law is the law of times and seasons. I, didn't, I don't have time. I would have told you what makes us fall away from these laws, but that will take our time. The law of times and seasons is also the law of opportunity. Things don't happen to people at the same time. There are certain seasons of your life that if you miss them, you are finished. That's why the people of the world say, opportunity comes but once. It will take mercy for that season to open up again. But many times, people don't take advantage of their seasons. Maybe because of sentiment. If I do it, what will men say? You didn't come to live for men. You came to live for God. Men will not mark your speed. God will. Too many people have lost their seasons because they didn't discern Kairos moments. There's a popular scripture everybody knows. First Chronicles 12 verse 32. It said the sons of Issachar had understanding of times and seasons and knew what Israel ought to do. Your life has been graduated into different seasons. Your growth is your ability to discern those seasons and to take advantage of all of them. Sometimes entering a season in your life will attract warfare. Don't bother about the warfare. Enter all the same. The grace to counter those warfare is part of that your season. If you are able to enter that season, you will neutralize that warfare. That warfare will become the basis for your promotion. There are certain seasons that come with a lot of wealth. There are certain seasons that come with a lot of warfare. Whatever it is, don't be distracted. Ensure you enter the season first. Because growth is actually your ability to discern your season and to enter them. Don't allow sentiment make you fail your season. Don't allow fear make you fail your season. If you fail your season, you are wrong. Everything they say about you will be correct. But when you step into your season, everything they say about you will be a lie. That's why you don't waste your time trying to impress everybody. Trying to prove yourself to everybody. Ignore them and focus on what God is saying. If you enter your next season, even those who were condemning you, a point will come, they will look for you and say, we are sorry. You only fail in life if you fail to enter your seasons. That's why sentiment is not a good enough factor to stop you. Fear is not a good enough factor. Warfare is not a good enough factor. I can tell you there are many people who were afraid of making the best decisions of their lives because they were afraid what people will say. Every great man makes difficult decisions. Every poor man fails to make difficult decisions. The difference between the mighty and the weak are the decisions they are able to make. The strong make strong decisions. That's why they are called strong. The weak never make strong decisions. That's why they suffer for the rest of their lives. I know a lot of people who started ministry at the age of 90. Some at the age of 40. Why? Because when God told them to move, they were afraid. I know a lot of people who started business at the age of 70. Because when God told them to move, they didn't move. That was one of the things that almost cost Abraham his life and destiny. He said, God had said to Abraham, get thee out of thy country. Abraham kept following his father. Until his father came to Haran and said, I'm not traveling again. That was when Abraham woke up and began to learn how to journey. Don't journey when circumstances force you. Journey when your seasons are open. Because the grace, the support, and the advantages you have all came in your season. You want to have dominion, you can't miss your seasons. When you miss your seasons, you will struggle. I had a friend who was working with a barrister. They were working in these chambers and his boss was so wicked. So wicked that when they go to court, his boss's friend, who are sons, Sometimes they come and they see the young barrister. You know, you are a son, I'm a son. And then we come to court for a case. And then you came with your assistant. That happens to be my friend. And then I look at you and say, ah, young lawyer, how are you doing? You know, these guys, they, they, are, they are big men. There's nothing to prove. They are son. When they come to court, they are like gods. So even though I'm coming to contend with your boss, that's not an issue. That one is at our level. You will look at the young barrister and say, how are you doing? And give him 20,000. When they finish the case and go home, the boss will say, How much did they give you? He says, 20,000. Take 3,000 and put the rest in the account. Uh-uh. 
even the money they dash me, if you don't do it, you are finished. And God told him, move, move. He didn't move for seven years. And you know how this thing works? In this kingdom, the year of service is seven. That's why when God created the world on the seventh year, he rested. When Jacob served Laban, he served him for seven years. He said, keep your slave for six years. On the seventh year, let him go. When you serve for seven years and God say, move now. If you don't move, you wait for 14 years. I'm telling you why many people never make impact. They miss their seasons. You may be speaking in tongues. You may be sort of prophesying. But you won't know why you are not moving. Because when you fail to move, God moves somebody else. And that person filled the vacuum you should have filled. And until another vacuum is open, God can move you. These are laws of dominion. It applies in ministry. It applies in business. There are many people listening to me today. They are 70 years old. When they look back, they cry. Because they can see all the opportunities that God asked them to take that they failed to take. That's why they are where they are. The law of times and seasons. I don't have time. Go and practice what you have, you have heard. But I'm telling you, when you begin to grow, you will discover that Christianity is bigger than sensation. If I begin to thunder in this place, a lot of people will be excited. But that you are excited doesn't mean you are going forward. Christianity is bigger than an emotion. The things that make for our progress and promotion are deliberate. And until we become deliberate in working with them, we will never succeed. There are lots of politicians. God told them six years ago, buy the form now. They were afraid. They didn't buy it. Six years later, they are struggling to buy the form. They don't even have the money to buy it again. Because they missed their seasons. That will not be your portion. Everything you require for life and for godliness, even as you are listening now, they are imparted in the name of Jesus. There are most of you here that have missed your seasons. But there's a principle of restoration. He said the hand of God was upon Elijah. He outran the chariots of Ahab. There is a window of the spirit by mercy that will be opened over you in this season. And so in the name of Jesus, I release that window over you. Do you know there are many ladies who are not married now because they missed their season? When their season was open, they didn't discern what God was doing. And now, the things they rejected eight years ago, they are praying for one of it to come back. Because they didn't discern their seasons. But in the name of the Lord Jesus, by the principles and provisions of mercy, everywhere you missed it, I decree a window of mercy. And in the name of Jesus, step into that window. The reason we teach these things is because there is something greater than a miracle. There is something greater than healing. Divine health is superior to healing. It may not be spectacular, but it is a thousand times superior to healing. So instead of receiving a healing, it is better to walk in divine health. A miracle is good, but it is not half as compared to walking in the blessing. There is somebody that received a miracle of a car. There is somebody that received a miracle of a money. There is another person that is walking in the blessing. They are two different realms. While you are receiving a miracle of a car, somebody has a car producing company. One is in the blessing, one is working in the miracle. The only way to walk in the blessing is to understand principles and laws. And so believers need to grow from the realm of miracles into the realm of the blessing. This is why we teach these things. And so there are many of you that have made mistakes, but because you have heard these things, the grace and the capacity to walk in the fullness. Receive it right now. 
Some of you are in leadership. Some of you are in the academia. Regardless of the strata where you find yourself, the anointing that makes men great, the wisdom that makes men invincible, in the name of Jesus the Christ, take that anointing now. Take that wisdom now. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus. Jesus said, Thou shalt know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Paul writing to Timothy, he said, From the days of thy youth, thou have known the holy scriptures, which is able to make thee wise unto salvation. These truths you have heard tonight, they have not just come to increase your vocabulary. They have not just come to increase your wealth of knowledge. They give unto you, they deliver unto you now, the power to walk in their experiences. The power to walk in the liberty that they command. The power to become all that is said in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name. Give the Lord a big hand. You may be seated. In the next three minutes, we are out of here. There are about eight laws I have here. I'm not able to exhaust them. There is a law of diligence. The law of diligence necessitates that you pay attention to details. A lot of people fail because they don't pay attention to details. They know a lot of things about a lot of things. When you call football, they know something. Call banking and finance, they know something. Call medical science, they know something. But they don't know detailed, they don't have detailed knowledge about anything. So they never succeed. There is the law of honor. The law of honor helps you to spend from the resources of another person. Because when you honor a man, what he carries begins to work for you. Because you may know so much, but what you know can never be enough for your destiny. So we need to honor those who carry graces that we don't have. So that we can walk in them. He said, if you give to a prophet in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. A prophet's reward is not a prophet's blessing. A prophet's reward is the power that makes him a prophet. It begins to work for you. It's the law of honor. And then number eight is the law of faith. If you don't step out, you will never see greatness. And you don't step out when things are easy. You step out when you are led to step out. If you master these laws... Your life will become a wonder to your generation. These things are not emotional. They are legalistic realities. And that's why I took time to share them the way I did. So that your emotions are not stirred. You pay attention to them. You take them and practice them. And see how your life will become great. In the name of Jesus Christ.